Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for the Winship Grand Rounds. If you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit or, or attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have issues with the webinar or the CME login, please send an email um, or, or email and drop me a note for that chat feature. Uh, this morning, we're excited to welcome Dr. Timothy Showalter. Dr. Showalter is a radiation oncologist who specializes in brachytherapy and external beam radiation therapy for gynecological cancer, genital urinary cancer, sarcomas, and other things. He's a full professor at UVA as of July. Um, he completed his residency at Thomas Jefferson University, where he stayed for his first faculty position before coming to UVA in 2012. His research focuses on patient-oriented research, including clinical trials, comparative effectiveness research aimed at improving radiation therapy methods and providing information to help cancer treatment decision-making. In 2015, he earned a master's of public health degree from Johns Hopkins to supplement his research training. Um, he's had various roles uh, nationally, including co-chair of the Patient Safety Committee of the American Brachytherapy Society. He's active nationally on several prostate and gynecological cancer committees, including the Patient Outcomes Research Committee of Energy Oncology. Uh, he grew up in Richmond, Virginia. He attended Washington and Lee University for his undergrad undergraduate education. He completed medical school where he works now at UVA and subsequently there met his wife, Shana LaFrac Showalter, who's on faculty in the Department of Surgery at UVA. The couple have three children, Lillian, Tessa, and Brooks. Outside of work, he's an avid squash player and enjoys traveling. Please welcome Dr. Showalter. Um, welcome, Tim. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. It's really uh, great to uh, have the opportunity to interact with this group. Um, I've got uh, several, there's several folks at uh, Emory that uh, I wish I could see in person, but, but it's, uh, it's still nice to, to visit uh, virtually. Um, so I, as, as Dr. Bradley mentioned, um, focus um, much of my clinical effort on um, brachytherapy, and um, I'm going to share a perspective for uh, focusing on innovation, um, but it's sort of a, a common sense efficiency uh, guided uh, focus that, that we've uh, tried to prioritize here at the University of Virginia, uh, and I, I hope to share with you sort of the need for further uh, innovation in, in this space. So for objectives, the first thing, I, I wanna convince you that there is a need for improved efficiency in brachytherapy. I wanna describe for you uh, an arc of innovation that culminated in a pretty uh, elegant and uh, sophisticated use of image guidance and uh, computerized treatment planning uh, for GYN and prostate brachytherapy. Uh, but it comes at a cost of efficiency uh, in terms, in a way that can affect the, um, the enthusiasm uh, nationally uh, for delivering uh, such treatment and uh, why sometimes, you know, perfect can get in the way of, of great and available. Uh, I'll provide some examples uh, for um, what I'm talking about when I refer to innovation focused on efficiency. Um, I'm going to step back uh, before describing uh, two uh, ongoing research programs that uh, are NCI funded, um, and just first give the local context at the University of Virginia and kind of uh, portray to you why I felt like when I came here in 2012, this was really the, um, the, uh, an opportunity and really a responsibility for, uh, for our center and our team to, to lead much of this work. For disclosures uh, research funding, uh, I, I do, uh, I will refer to a product that has been, is in development that is not commercially available, uh, that is solely funded by grants. So that's, that's the second research uh, project I will mention. And then as I was updating Dr. Bradley, I recently um, started a position with Flatiron Health, which is a research uh, company, uh, will not be within the scope of this presentation. 
So first, since there are some non-radiation oncologists uh, in, in the uh, meeting, and since um, you know, many folks uh, you know, like to ignore brachytherapy in their <laughs> practice and instead choose to focus on radiosurgery or other uh, interesting modalities, um, just a refresher for many of you that brachytherapy is the um, you know, procedurally focused class uh, sub, sub uh, part of radiation oncology in which a radioactive source um, or, or, or multiple radioactive sources are placed into or directly next to a tumor for treatment at a short distance. Um, it is clearly, it's axiomatic that it is the most conformal form of radiation treatment because there is no uh, issue surrounding entrance and ex exit of the beam. So the source is literally placed into the tumor or next to the tumor. Uh, so uh, even as uh, technology improves, um, there's all, there is necessarily a tension that should be addressed between you know, is the competing uh, external beam technology sufficiently similar to brachytherapy to replace brachytherapy for that indication and there are likely several situations for which um, brachytherapy is uh, advantageous. What you see here on this curve uh, to the right is a uh, comparison of dose deposition uh, over uh, depth of tissue for external beam radiation therapy uh, using one, one particular uh, common uh, photon energy versus brachytherapy, and you can see that with a relatively fast, uh, you know, rapid fall off, the, the radiation dose is deposited very near the brachytherapy source and then falls away rapidly over time. On the left is just an example of dose distributions from prostate external beam radiation therapy versus brachytherapy. Uh, prostate uh, treatment is an often discussed uh, uh, modality uh, uh, disagreement between brachytherapists and external beam radiation therapy, but they're great data for uh, either one of those modalities. So um, trends over the past 20 years. So um, brachytherapy is a, you know, a traditional form of, uh, of radiation treatment, uh, fall, uh, hearkening back to the original uh, experience with implanting radium. Uh, and um, it's really progressed much since then. What's shown on the left uh, is uh, meant to be a you know, old school traditional um, brachytherapy approach. I will tell you that this is the era I trained in, uh, in the, you know, starting in the mid 2000s. Um, and I still had a wax pencil stain on the uh, vest, uh, the chest pocket of all my white coats. Uh, and we were in an era where we primarily focused on point based dose prescriptions, so you would, uh, pers you would perform an implant and evaluate the quality of the implant uh, based on fluoroscopic imaging. Uh, and the goal would be to make things consistent and midline and reproducible. Uh, and then the treatment plan was based on traditional systems and nomenclature in which you would prescribe a dose to a point and hope that the two-dimensional points corresponded to the important critical structures such as the rectum and bladder that you were uh, intending to um, protect. Uh, over the past you know, 15 to 20 years, things have really transformed. So we now use uh, MRI uh, and other forms of imaging really throughout the uh, treatment planning process. Um, in many cases, that involves uh, co-registration of CT imaging with MRI imaging. In some cases, that involves directly using an MRI, for example, in a MR brachytherapy suite. Um, dose prescriptions are also uh, routinely um, prescribed on a per volume basis, meaning that there's a customized treatment plan and the radiation dose is essentially prescribed to a cloud that the physician has control over uh, shaping and customizing that uh, addresses uh, priorities uh, in terms of tumor control and sparing normal tissues. We've learned a ton in the past uh, 20 years uh, for this, uh, and we have discovered that many of our traditional um, point-based prescription systems uh, left a lot of opportunity for improving outcomes on the table, uh, and perhaps our points didn't always correspond with uh, what was really going on. Um, so um, it's, it's been a new era. Uh, corresponding changes have occurred in prostate brachytherapy and other indications that involve volume-based prescriptions and trans, uh, 
um, translating uh, improvements in image-guided brachytherapy uh, into clinical care. Uh, so why do we do it? Well, um, we do image-guided brachytherapy not because we have the, um, the tools to do it now and because it looks good on the computer, but because consistently um, folks have shown that you know, all the evidence points to both improved uh, local control rates uh, and, improve, and reduced uh, toxicity events and uh, improved quality of life with the movement toward the critical movement towards uh, image-guided brachytherapy. I've called out an example for intracavitary cervical cancer brachytherapy, which is one of the most compelling uh, and important uses of brachytherapy, but similar findings have been uh, found uh, really across all indications for brachytherapy. Uh, this transition in technology is analogous to um, uh, tra translating the, the changes in external beam radiation therapy that um, translated simple APPA um, you know, two-dimensional external beam prescriptions to, to IMRT. So it, rather than a stepwise um, progression, it's a really dramatic transformation that occurred over a relatively short time. So it's not surprising that outcomes are significantly improved. Um, so contemporary GYN brachytherapy is much more complex. So uh, from the days in the basement at Jefferson when I did my uh, training with two-dimensional uh, brachytherapy drawn, uh, you know, evaluated uh, with a printout to the plan uh, placed underneath a cut film uh, radiograph. Um, the, the world has gotten uh, much more sophisticated in brachytherapy, but also much more complex. So um, based on what one would consider the academically sort of research evidence-based um, gold standard that's performed at many uh, academic centers. Uh, the overall uh, treatment process involves multiple MRIs uh, and depending on the uh, facilities that may involve MRIs plus CT. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, when you have imaging obtained in real time with an applicator in place with the live patient who's laying on a uh, stretcher with, with an applicator in place, um, everything has to be done in real time. Uh, so uh, a lot of these steps um, have to be performed without delays to page a physician or a physicist. Um, so uh, you, uh, providers at, at centers that offer this fully actualized form of MR-based uh, brachytherapy generally will devote at least one physician full-time equivalent uh, to an entire day of brachytherapy serving maybe two patients. So uh, it's, a, it's a very heavy lift for this. Currently, the um, best example of very high quality advanced uh, MRI guided brachytherapy is being uh, led by a group called, uh, that's the, the clinical trial is called the EMBRACE study, and they're in the second iteration of the EMBRACE study. Uh, it's currently in progress. Um, the uh, form of brachytherapy that's used involves um, placing uh, applicators that are in the upper vagina and in, in the uterus and supplementing those the, the uh, dose distributions with needles uh, placed into the parametrial tissue, just lateral to those applicators, are called hybrid applicators. Um, and uh, throughout all portions of radiation therapy, including the external beam as well as the brachytherapy, um, PET and MR imaging is used for uh, adaptive uh, treatment planning. Uh, it's a fantastic form of treatment. Uh, it's an idealized form of dose sparing uh, in terms of um, the brachytherapy and, and what doses are being delivered to the tumor. Uh, those are escalated and the doses to the um, rectum and bladder and other critical structures like the vaginal mucosa are uh, optimally reduced. Um, a requirement for participation in the trial is that the MRI is performed with the applicator in situ for brachytherapy. So that means that uh, to conduct this procedure, it has to be the applicator would need to be placed either in the uh, MR room or in a separate procedure room, and then the MRI is uh, performed. Uh, patients enrolled in this trial have multiple insertions of brachytherapy. So it's a very elegant treatment, um, and it requires a significant institutional commitment over time. Um, there are a lot of steps to this, as you can imagine. So I've called out one example for um, 
uh, that was prepared, written by uh, Matthew Harkenreiter, uh, who uh, described implementation of MRCT uh, registered brachytherapy uh, at their center. Um, their institution has, has adapted to the, um, the incorporation of MR for GYN brachytherapy um, by limiting the number of insertions and giving multiple fractions um, for, for a, an individual insertion, uh, which can uh, save some uh, institutional resources for personnel time and facility uh, time. Uh, and this is just one example of, of what they um, were able to accomplish by working as a team and getting through things. So I'm in a small institution. There are six radiation oncologists. Um, and the downside of all the innovation is that now we've got this beautiful treatment that is really amazing and has been shown to improve outcomes. Um, but there's a problem uh, in particularly that's called out in the United States system, but it also exists at other places. So here's the problem. So over time, uh, we have seen that the use of brachytherapy uh, despite these remarkable advances in the technology has declined over time. Uh, so there have been several uh, database studies that have demonstrated for cervical cancer in particular where uh, the decline in local control uh, related to the emission of brachytherapy directly correlates to survival. And these are in young patients. So it's often written about and it's a very important, there's no way to replace brachytherapy. So this is a very important trend from a public health and sort of social justice perspective as well. Um, similarly, we've seen trends in prostate brachytherapy, um, and I will tell you just candidly that these trends in um, the declining use of brachytherapy despite mounting evidence that uh, outcomes are excellent and improvements in the technology um, has really uh, occurred in all settings, uh, and this is for um, prostate cancer specifically. Uh, in looking at the general research, it's the, uh, it's the, pro the brachytherapy procedures that require a, a level of complexity and commitment to uh, skills. And we have not seen similar declines in brachytherapy. For example, vaginal cuff brachytherapy that is um, pretty uh, easy to perform and can be rapidly delivered without um, requiring a trip to a, the operating room or procedure room. So what's going on here? So as you can imagine, in a um, actual like business environment, which both nonprofit and um, for-profit health systems are to some degree, because um, you know the, the overall principle of no margin emission is quite quite important and resonates in really all settings. But the contributors have been called out over time, so. Um, there's a few principles at play. So many of our other modalities like IMRT, SBRT, and protons are really broadly applicable across all cancers, while the brachytherapy indications are really uh, specific to a few settings where the technical trade-off is such that brachytherapy uh, is likely to improve outcomes. The, there are specific resource demands of brachytherapy, so it does require specific uh, equipment and consumable supplies that are specific to brachytherapy and not applicable to other um, radiation oncology services within a cancer center. Um, there's significant physician time demands of brachytherapy, uh, particularly if you operate at a center where brachytherapy needs to be performed in a separate location uh, compared to uh, external beam radiation therapy. Reimbursement rates are lower for brachytherapy uh, compared to IMRT when viewed from the perspective of the physician. And then certainly because it requires more physician time and the reimbursement is lower, there's a pretty large um, uh, difference in the reimbursement to effort ratio uh, that incentivizes against brachytherapy. And then partnered with that and probably partially related to that, there's a general decline in skills and educational exposure by decreased case counts at uh, many uh, residency programs. Um, so moving on, I'll tell you that we, our group summarized kind of a framework for understanding what happened to brachytherapy and um, I, you know, waded into this controversy a little bit and I've had my hand slapped a couple, a couple times by professional societies, but um, I do think that uh, many of the explanations for the decline of uh, brachytherapy roll up to um, 
systematic um, uh, issues related to healthcare reimbursements that just make it untenable. Uh, so when looked at from a historical perspective, the decline in brachytherapy um, was, was um, occurred over the same time that SBRT and IMRT became much more prevalent and during the time that reimbursement for IMRT became much more favorable compared to brachytherapy. Um, it certainly does um, require more physician time. We know from other settings, for example, the self-referral patterns for prostate IMRT among urologists and inappropriate ADT utilization that physician behavior certainly is influenced by finances and not in a malign way, but just in a practical uh, resource allocation uh, perspective, trying to do the most with the existing resources. Uh, additionally, the increase in freestanding radiation centers that occurred um, based on uh, reimbursement policy changes favored by uh, CMS uh, during a specific time period may be associated with it. So my hypothesis is that the educational deficiencies and the lack of comfort with brachytherapy are really the byproduct of these uh, trends rather than the cause. So we looked at UVA just to sort of try to um, put a number on some of these factors at uh, what, what things look like within our rapid workflow model. And we are exceptional in, in the speed at which we deliver basically community level uh, brachytherapy services where we prioritize uh, the pace of the procedure uh, rather than going fully into the embrace style uh, image guided brachytherapy. I've called out here a couple things. One is that even in our rapid workflow environment, the brachytherapy course required over 400 minutes of attending time and the external beam radiation course required 60 minutes uh, at a pretty massive personnel cost to the practice plan. Uh, and the reimbursement, um, the attending time per uh, physician reimbursement was substantially higher for uh, HDR brachytherapy compared to IMRT or 3D conformal radiation therapy. And this is a very radiation oncologist um, specific perspective, but I offer it um, as just an example for sort, sort of scoping the, the overall issue. Uh, similar findings for prostate cancer, um, and I'll tell you dissimilar findings for vaginal cuff brachytherapy, where for prostate cancer, the um, brachytherapy services require much more time per unit of, of reimbursement uh, that goes to a practice plan um, and much more physician costs associated with it uh, than external beam options. Uh, we've seen the same thing for, um, for uh, breast brachytherapy as well. So if you pick up any uh, cost effectiveness analysis, you'll see that uh, based on a payer perspective, breast brachytherapy or accelerated partial breast irradiation uh, is more cost effective, meaning um, based on the reimbursement that's provided, it's a, it's a very cost effective option. However, viewed from the institutional perspective, uh, it actually costs quite a lot <laughs> to deliver breast brachytherapy. And uh, much of that uh, relates to both personnel and consumable expenses, those disposable uh, brachytherapy applicators. Uh, and um, it required 24% uh, more attending time than whole breast radiation therapy. This is not from uh, UVA, this is from uh, a VCU paper, but um, I felt it was good enough. We didn't need to look at that at our institution. Um, so my take on the brachytherapy decline and sort of what, what I wanna uh, drive home uh, is that I, if you look at survey results, um, you'll find that people mention that the drivers for, of the decline in brachytherapy relate to physician time, the need for training even after residency, uh, and issues related to physician coverage and the lack of availability, availability at small centers. And my take on all those things is that they're all related to um, what is the financial payoff for it relative to other options. So coverage, more physician FTEs can be obtained if, um, if it makes sense from a business case perspective. Uh, so that, that was sort of my vantage point for, um, for, for moving forward and trying to do something about it. So what can be done to reverse the trend? So payment policy changes and advocacy are important and those are ongoing and to the credit of uh, ABS and Astro leaders um, both, uh, they've done a really fantastic job for it. Other things that can be done are developing workflows and methods that uh, give physicians the opportunity to, um, to realize much of the gains, but maybe not 100% of the gains of Embrace 2 style image guided 
uh, brachytherapy, um, but to do it in a way that's time efficient. Uh, so what can we do that maximizes value? Understanding that uh, we have a real issue and responsibility to community providers to, to offer this. Uh, and so physicians need better tools to, to improve the physician experience and patients need better access to this. So local context at UVA. So I'll tell you, we represent a facility where very few resources are devoted uh, to brachytherapy with the exception of a fantastic um, brachytherapy suite. So years ago, the um, cancer center raised some uh, patient funds with the model of serving the tobacco footprint region uh, cervical cancer patients who come from very far and need to get in and need to get home. Uh, so we uh, had uh, the a gift of several million dollars to have an image guided brachytherapy suite. This predated me. We, it's in a facility that's separate from the hospital. Uh, sedation is really not possible but because in its setting and based on the local regulations it requires two um, fully licensed attending physicians to one to do the procedure and one to administer the sedation. We only have anesthesia coverage two days per week. Um, our center is relatively leanly staffed um, and you know, the average single provider, you know, separate from grant funding and everything has, generates more than 15,000 RVUs per year. So it's a pretty busy practice. Um, and our uh, medical center administers from a cost center budget, meaning that all this, we don't, um, there's no win from doing more procedures, but there's a loss from consuming more supplies. Uh, we are all in one space, uh, so the, the uh, procedure room is right down the hall from all the Lenox and all the clinics, uh, and we have no MRI in the building, uh, and um, we, yeah, so that, that's the general perspective. We have excellent physics and nursing, and so that, those are the resources we came in. This is a picture of our um, image-guided brachytherapy suite. I came in 2012 with the goal of trying to figure out what to do and how to grow this as a resource. At that point, it hadn't really been um, uh, utilized. Uh, this is the general layout. So we've got CT control in the room. We've got an HDR source. We've got a, a CT on rails or sliding gantry CT, and we've got space for anesthesia equipment that can be relocated to either side of the room. Uh, our table's got a CT compatible insert. There's plenty of square footage for portable imaging. And um, you know, right now we have specimen mammograph unit, we have ultrasound units. Um, you know, we, we've got plenty of room in there. So the idea originally was for rapid workflow. And when I came in 2012 and started to work with the team, we decided to really focus on that and put it into action motivated by the need we felt to, to generate innovation that was, that was also um, co-prioritizing uh, efficiency. So this is our workflow. So when we uh, perform a procedure, we may do sophisticated um, imaging acquisition beforehand. We, we may do CTV delineation. We may do a tentative pre-plans based on MRI. And then we use image processing software either directly in the brachytherapy treatment planning software or in an alternative um, approach. And um, we, when the day of the procedure, the patient comes in, is pre-medicated or undergoes anesthesia and has everything, applicator insertion, planning, treatment delivery, removal without leaving the, uh, the procedure table. Um, we can do a, a routine uh, tandem anovoid brachytherapy case uh, for our first fraction, including sewing in a smit sleeve, generally just over an hour. Uh, and we, we do our own smit sleeves, so we don't have to wait for um, a surgeon. Uh, and our procedures, our subsequent fraction procedures, generally are 40 minutes or so. Um, this is what a workflow looks at a typical um, uh, facility. Uh, so you would register the patient, insert the applicator, then they go somewhere and wait, then they have a CT scan, then they wait, then they have an MRI or PET CT, and then they wait, and then they go get treatment. And there are potential time seeks at every process along the way. Uh, so we wanted to prioritize avoiding that. And as temptations have come up to, to, uh, for technology, we've always prioritized workflow. Um, the integrated brachytherapy suite does save time. Uh, it avoids transfers. So um, personnel goes in and out. The patient stays in one place. We always know where the patient is. Um, the other benefit for a small facility like us is that, frankly, a radiation oncology attending can upper, co cover other things too. Brief step aways during non-critical portions of the case to check an SBRT or uh, other sort of situations. 
Um, it does allow us to perform a high volume of brachytherapy with a relatively lean uh, MD coverage. And that's important because I already showed you that the business case for physician staffing is really not there, uh, frankly, for brachytherapy. Um, brachytherapy equipment itself is not expensive relative to external beam radiation therapy, so we're able to offer it as sort of an addition to the external beam uh, services. And we feel pretty strongly that the efficiency helps both patients and providers. So let me give you some examples. So one simple thing is we have all hands on deck at all points in our program. We contour before each case, we have redundant ultrasound probes, redundant equipment and supplies, kits, sterilized trays, so that we're never waiting for small price products. We also make sure that since we need a physicist second check, that, we, that they, parts of those occur in parallel, so there's never a pause for, to do work, and other centers have found that these uh, steps are also useful. What else can be done? So um, uh, Sushil Berrywal from the University of Pittsburgh has demonstrated that uh, in their uh, facility, using one MRI rather than the multiple uh, expenses and added work of, of five MRIs delivers most of the, of the value in terms of uh, uh, dos dosimetric out outcomes. Um, we have published on the use of parallelized uh, physics workflow and sort of um, uh, and University of Pittsburgh has done a similar thing. Uh, so the, uh, they have found that the steps that helped improve their uh, timeline for brachytherapy is having the MR suite next to the radiation oncology department and having uh, administrative pre-plans for that. And they worked on the MRI scan sequence to uh, take it from 35 minutes to eight minutes. At UVA, uh, based on our resources, I'm, as I mentioned, anesthesia is at an absolute premium we are really tied to placing Smith sleeves because we need to do as much as we can for subsequent fractions with a patient wake, awake with mild sedation. So we place a um, Smith sleeve uh, on at, during the first fraction and we do not have an MRI scan. Uh, and then we obtain the MRI between the first and second fraction and we uh, register based on the, we register the two scans based on the Smith sleeve rather than the applicator, which is what the GAC-ESTRO uh, guidelines are. So we sort of adapted that in a way where we feel like we get most of the value, you know, 80% of our treatments delivered with an MRI. Uh, so it's slightly a step back from what uh, Dr. Berrywall published, but it preserves our rapid workflow and works in our environment. So again, we were able to incorporate MRI without violating our uh, workflow model. So let me take another look at um, more of a premier research program, and I would say a better example of um, patient-oriented uh, innovation that's focused on efficiency in the patient experience. Um, so as I mentioned, we have this focus on workflow and the focus on doing things that um, you know, move brachytherapy forward, but in a way that preserves the workflow. When, um, when we came to UVA, we realized that this facility also created a great opportunity to address breast IRT concerns. So there are technical concerns regarding mobile IRT units and the low doses delivered with, uh, the, with conventional breast um, IRT uh, and also with the local recurrence rates observed after the target study. So our idea was to try to address that with standard routinely available brachytherapy uh, techniques. Um, it also helped that uh, I have a very close collaboration with uh, the breast surgeon that is the uh, co-lead of the program. Uh, so this is the curve that a lot of people have seen from uh, the target trial. Uh, Five-year local recurrence rates were 2% higher. I will tell you there's plenty of research showing that patients are willing to accept that for the convenience. Um, there's also plenty of valid concerns among providers uh, and I will say in the U.S., uh, we have not embraced IRT broadly, and our, certainly our guidelines don't uh, recognize it because there are concerns about the very low dose of the uh, treatment that's delivered and the lack of image guidance. Um, on the other hand, there's this really interesting story that um, the uh, survival, the, the rates of mortality were actually lower in the target study for the um, target uh, the patients who received IRT compared to external beam radiation. So there are, there are all these lingering issues about uh, breast IRT that make it interesting to explore. You know, uh, one can hypothesize whether this is related to lymphopenia after external beam treatment. Who knows? But 
uh, it's certainly interesting and probably not something we just want to set aside and abandon. Uh, so in terms of overall options, just for the non-radiation oncologist there, I'll tell you that the traditional standard has been whole breast irradiation. Uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of enthusiasm um, and uh, this APBI it was, has been a trending modality over the years uh, where you treat part of the breast, the idea being to treat the area that's responsible for about 90% of recurrences and uh, avoid exposing the rest of the breast as well, breast as, well as uh, heart uh, lungs, that sort of thing. And there are a few options for it. Um, we first, in it for our program, started by comparing conventional breast um, IORT, which is the, from the, as the form done in the target trial, to what we could do with a multi-channel brachytherapy applicator that's routinely available, had been FDA approved years ago. There was nothing really novel about it other than trying to figure out what we could do for a single fraction. And we first did a dosimetric study that where we demonstrated that, yes, it is true, like everyone would, would imagine that the fundamental do dosimetry of uh, brachytherapy uh, gives you the opportunity with multiple channels and multiple dwell positions to have more conformal dosimetry than uh, a single point dose done with conventional IORT. That was surprising to no one. It all rolls up and relates to a um, the better dose homogeneity index, which is a concept that just means how closely can you get the dose to uh, what the target volume is. Uh, we were able to um, project that we could consistently deliver uh, brachytherapy within the context of a clinical trial for a dose of 12.5 gray to one centimeter away from the, um, from the lumpectomy cavity. Uh, in the target trial, just for context, uh, five to seven gray was the dose. Now, our dose that we projected we could deliver was biologically less than was, is delivered in other radiation oncology contexts. But again, our vantage point was what's done with conventional breast IRT and how can we improve upon that? And we felt like we had the opportunity to do that. So here's the general idea. And this is like uh, almost like a marketing <laughs> version that's appropriate for uh, non-radiation oncologists. But the basic gist is that we actually do use imaging, unlike conventional breast radiation. We have a CT done at the time of lumpectomy. The procedures, the lumpectomy is done in the brachy suite. We put, the surgeon places the balloon directly under direct visualization. Uh, we can shape the dose, but based on the brachytherapy applicator and the fundamentals of brachytherapy, and it lets us get a higher dose. Um, we also we still uh, can spare the heart because it's a single single dose, and and it's it's very conformal. Uh, so we pushed this forward within our university. Um, the university really got behind it at the health system level. Some of the nurse uh, administrators are really supportive of it. And these are from like local uh, press releases locally. My collaborator is also my uh, wife, which helps a lot. Um, and development steps. So we did the dose metric study. We got through all of the, the vetoes that you get on the health system side for innovation. We finished a phase one trial of safety and feasibility. Uh, and then we designed a, a phase two trial. Early on, we did this with pilot study, and then later on, um, we, um, we funded it with the in, a five-year uh, R01 from the NIH. Uh, so the basic gist, you know, so we developed um, programmatic materials like this that sort of uh, position the, in a simple version what we're really talking about uh, to patients, and I think it resonates with non-oncology providers as well. So the basic gist is, you know, we're improving upon um, what's done for, uh, for IORT. We're not really improving upon, compared to other forms of radiation therapy that are, occur over a more protracted time point, we're just using the basic skills that, uh, and techniques that are available for those. Um, but what we're doing is pr presenting a personalized treatment plan, delivering a high dose, avoiding uh, applicator placement errors and allowing for customization compared to conventional breast IORT. So primary results, so we published the results of our phase one trial. We showed that it took an additional uh, time to deliver the IORT uh, that was just over an hour. Uh, and that was our feasibility criteria because we figured no one would ever do it if it took too long. You got your surgeon waiting there. Um, I will tell you uh, institutionally that we made sure that the surgeons could do other things while they were waiting for us to do our thing. 
Uh, we had no grade three toxicity events. We had six grade two uh, soft tissue toxicity events. And my non-scientific impression is that we had fewer soft tissue complications than when at UVA we offered uh, you know, 10 fraction APBI. It's a, it's a lower dose, so it's not surprising. Um, this is an example of a, another publication we published uh, that shows an example of what we're talking about when we say we find interesting things on CT and we fix them before we deliver brachytherapy. Uh, so in a quarter of our patients, we found things like this where we had a huge air gap. Um, the surgeon in this case performed an adjacent tissue uh, transfer to improve uh, conformity and avoid that air pocket. Certainly we've done other things, fill with saline, put, drape a saline bag over top of uh, the chest to uh, compress the air out, you name it, we, we've, we've done different. We've, we've identified a clip that needed to be removed that suggests that lumpectomy wasn't ideal, uh, even before the, um, the pathologist paged us to, to let us know. Um, there's an ongoing uh, phase uh, two uh, trial now. It's a, it's a single arm, a 325 uh, subject trial that's open at three centers led by UVA. Uh, it embraces different workflows, so dis distributed workflows where the surgery happens in a different location on the same day, for example, in a more typical setting that's uh, externally valid to settings outside of UVA. Primary endpoint for that study is five-year ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. We're also um, evaluating the immune effects of a single fraction of partial breast irradiation compared to whole breast irradiation. Um, findings to date, so we have uh, validated and in a subset of patients, the uh, presence of imaging is really critical. So it suggests a need uh, in the context of conventional breast irradiation to either include volumetric imaging or risk not identifying these issues. Uh, it does add 50 to 90 minutes to cases. Uh, certainly that's less of an issue in a distributed workflow where it's not available in one area. We published on low toxicity rates, favorable cosmesis rates, and minimal quality of life changes, not surprising for uh, treatment like this. Uh, our accrual is very nearly complete. We'll finish later this year on all 325 patients. Uh, based on the timeline of accrual and when we started, we expect to publish primary results in 2022, most likely. Um, the enthusiasm of patients has been remarkable, uh, and it's really taught the inside of like empowered patients um, being very interested in a patient-centered uh, research question. Uh, that addresses an area of unmet need. Um, we found, uh, you know, one of the concerns from the health system perspective was, was this going to cannibalize our uh, whole breast irradiation volume? Um, we found that that was not the case. It did not cannibalize whole breast radiation therapy. We saw no decline in our external beam radiation therapy. In fact, we saw an uptick over time. Uh, and it's like the highest clinical trial and most rapid uh, trial accrual that the cancer center has seen before. Um, and so really at the cancer center level, that's also an important uh, metric as well. We've also um, brought many of these uh, families into the UVA health system away from uh, the private uh, hospital nearby. All right, so that's to let you know that that is a win. We view it um, as like the, the uh, linchpin of our overall uh, brachytherapy program. Um, I'm gonna transition to a separate product and I'm just gonna glance over it because I wanna save time uh, for questions. Uh, so this is in an earlier stage, uh, although it started around the same time, it's taken longer uh, to develop. Uh, so when I transitioned to UVA, I started becoming more involved in GYN than in GU, and we, served, we performed a massive volume of cases. So my first year, I performed over 200 uh, tandem and ovoid brachytherapy cases, and I started to experience more and more of the uh, clinical uh, imperfections of, of what was available uh, uh, in terms of tools. Um, brachytherapy remains essential for locally advanced disease. Uh, for cervical cancer, there's really like no alternative for cervical cancer, whereas for other indications like breast and prostate, for example, there are plenty of other uh, very good ways to deliver radiation therapy as well. So this is not a convenient play. This is like absolutely getting people the, the care that they need. Um, so, one little thing that used to frustrate me, it still does frustrate me a little bit, is um, packing. So at the end of the procedure, you either have to use packing to, fill, to um, stabilize the applicator and displace the bladder or rectum. You either use gauze, which is generally used, um, it's essentially free, it's very inexpensive. It's, it's generally used in the operating room 
and placement and removal can, can be uncomfortable for patients depending on the specific applicator that you're using and what the context is. Um, at UVA, I convinced our administrators at great cost to the hospital to use um, a balloon, commercially available balloon-based product uh, that costs uh, at least somewhere around $400 per procedure, and it's a cost that goes to the hospital. It's not a pass-through cost, so the hospital had to pay, you know, assume a $2,000 charge for, for me to basically uh, do the program on an outpatient basis. So I started thinking, and I would tell you, I had a, I was very naive and just like uninformed back at this time, maybe in 2012. I had the idea to originally use like spray foam uh, that people have used, you know, for home repairs and different things uh, to to serve this need. Um, I went through a process uh, of finding a chemist uh, collaborator to do something. It required me to go outside of UVA and work with someone who was at the time faculty at the at uh, Virginia Tech, which is a few hours away. Uh, and he quickly explained to me that polyurethane spray foam is highly carcinogenic and that was a terrible idea. But we, it launched a uh, stepwise um, process of seeking pilot funds, developing prototypes, having a postdoc work on things, and ultimately disclosing a patent to uh, UVA and Virginia Tech, um, to, which they litigated uh, and converted to a, uh, a full uh, patent as well. Uh, so we did some cadaver work and some other work initially to show that, to compare uh, what we could achieve with balloon um, packing uh, versus gauze and hydrogel. So these are images from soft cured uh, cadavers uh, at the University of Virginia, uh, and much of this work has been um, published already. Um, so our, my goal for product development uh, was to come up with something that would be comfortable for patients, like compared to gauze, you know, the balloons are perfectly comfortable. I didn't have a problem with that. I wanted to make sure that there was good attenuation and performance around the applicator itself to absorb uh, and attenuate uh, hotspots. And I really, it was price driven. So I wanted to make sure that we could offer something. This, I wanted to see what I could do with grant funding um, to basically have something that would be as inexpensive as possible ultimately when it came to market. Other than that, I had no business training. So I'll tell you uh, where we are to date. So um, pilot funding achieved at the state level for funds specific to cross institutional collaborations. We identified a existing previously described and characterized chemical reaction called a Michael Thiol click reaction. Uh, that we pursued and uh, figured out how to adapt the, um, the performance of that gel to what we were looking for. Um, we have demonstrated that the gel itself uh, can expand to conform uh, most cavities rather than just forming the shape of um, its like container. For example, we're, we're using a therapy bag and rather than uh, adapting to a uniform shape of the bag, the gel expands to uh, form, uh, to fill cavities. Um, we uh, conducted product development with a whole slew of consultants and external contract manufacturers. And we have finally opened a clinical trial that's open at uh, University of Virginia and the product, the final product designs on the left. Uh, and um, it will open at the University of Pittsburgh very soon. Um, we have had pre-submission discussions with the FDA, which was something I'd never done before. Um, and uh, I have uh, a whole team of consultants that work this stuff out. And my job is essentially being like PI of the, um, of the NCI grants that support this and uh, you know, keep the consultants on track and work things out. So uh, there's a whole bunch of conflict issues that when you're an academic uh, person, you have to uh, deal with. So I'm actually not the PI of the clinical trial, nor was I involved in writing the clinical trial, but um, you know, that's, it's uncharted and interesting uh, territory. So hopefully it will have uh, results at some point. It's not commercially available. I don't know if it ever will be, or, or, or this is just a learning exercise for us, but I hope it does at, at some point. Um, what I learned from this process though, that I think, uh, you know, I include as mainly perspective for uh, trainees or others, even senior people, there's plenty of time to do this, um, is that ideas from clinicians are important and there aren't enough of us who are like in the weeds and focus on, on uh, what we need to use in practice to come up with ideas and there are even fewer of us um, that follow through with them. So it's not enough to disclose a, 
an invention and then hope that someone will take and run with it, really to de-risk a technology and get it far enough along that somebody would license the product or something, you've got to go quite a bit further than that. Uh, and I have found that just staying on top of things and trying things, even when I have no idea uh, what a consultant is talking about, uh, that innovation is possible. And I think that this particular innovation is an, another example of, of just something to make a physician's life easier and to offer good, a good product to a, a patient that they might not otherwise get. Um, I think it's one of those examples where just do, start doing something. Uh, if you want to do a project and you have an idea, uh, the NCI has great resources more broadly, the NIH has great resources, but I'll tell you that the, um, the small business stuff within the NCI in terms of workshops and, and providing a roadmap and connections to resources and advisors is, is really unparalleled. Um, the other thing that I learned, my mistakes have all been not understanding and uh, exploring to learn more about the whole process. So like who needs to develop something? What, what's the relevant expertise? How is it actually produced? Like how do you, double check um, and verify that when it ultimately comes to a product that it's like physicians are ready to use it and that you're sure that what is in that you know sterile wrapped kit is what you uh, developed and what and what's what the design calls for um, there are consultants for all aspects of this and it can be fit if you are efficient it can be fit within grant models so we we've been able to get as far as we have with just uh, grant funding. Uh, so it's been pretty, including reimbursing UVA for IP filing costs as well. Um, I have learned that it's really important to interview friends and colleagues about your idea, even those uh, whom have the exact same clinical skill set of you and who you expect will have the exact same perspective may have very different ideas and very different priorities as well. Uh, and my own perspective, why I'm excited about moving this forward um, is that uh, you know, if something gets to a patient, it's much more a clinical impact than the paper you write potentially or the grant you submit. So it's very, it's been a very exciting process for me. Um, I think this is an exciting era of image guided brachytherapy. Do not mean to discredit any of the wonderful advances. My point is that we're in an era now where we need to figure out a way to implement these, particularly in the United States, so that they can be the advances and that high quality brachytherapy can be available for our patients. We do know that these technologies save lives, especially in locally advanced uh, cervical cancer. But we need to recognize that we do exist in the real world and we need to make sure that our procedures that we do and what we're, what we're doing as researchers can get that last mile into actual uh, patient care and that it can be implemented more broadly than our own centers. Uh, and I think there's lots of room for innovation in all aspects of oncology uh, that is focused on efficiency and the experiences of, of patients as well as the providers, honestly, uh, for care. Uh, and I think that's ultimately the way to get uh, to improve access and make brachytherapy more broadly available. So I'm happy to pause now and uh, take any questions. Thanks, Tim, for that fascinating talk. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located on the bottom right of your screen. While we wait for questions, um, please plan to tune in next week as our ground round speaker will be Dr. Ivan Maylard from the University of Pennsylvania, who will be presenting from, on uh, the title, From Grass, Graft Versus Host Disease to Lymphoma Pathogenesis, New Roles for stromal notch ligands in hematology. Uh, you can view all upcoming Winship Ground Rounds lectures on the Winship Ground Rounds page. Um, let's see if we have any questions. I see three here. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, Tony Ng, how is from Tony Ng, how to make hydrogel firm enough to push the bladder and rectum away from the TNO? So that is a very good question. And what I've learned, and I knew nothing about material science before this, is that that relates to what's called modulus. Uh, so our development process was um, specifically geared towards finding a um, chemical reaction and a particular concentration of the components that would deliver a sufficient modulus for that. Um, I, there's no place to look it up. So it took a while to figure out what our target was. And we started off by looking at uh, 10 kilopascals as our, as our target um, modulus. 
Uh, and that around that range is what, um, the reason why we picked that is that that's what, what occurs with Valsalva maneuver. Uh, and so we felt like that was a, a good reference point and our work with soft cured cadavers, which have tissue distensibility that's similar to actual patients, uh, suggests that that will be appropriate. Although that's one of the uh, not completely defined areas that we'll find out when we get into clinical trials, which we haven't, um, we haven't uh, actually treated a patient yet. So ho hopefully next month or, um, or in March we will. Second question from Dr. Jill Rimick. What is your opinion on how the APM will affect brachytherapy reimbursement? Um, I'm very nervous about it. I will tell you, I don't know any better than you. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement initially. There are some concerns. Uh, I think the most um, problematic concern is for prostate seed implants where the sources uh, will no longer be a um, pass through cost. Um, so that that would be part of the of the overall reimbursement. And that's a, for, that's a several thousand dollar implication for a health system that may make uh, prostate seed implants uh, not appealing for those centers that are in the APM model. But my sense is a lot of that isn't fully worked out. And uh, it's an area of more concern than enthusiasm for brachytherapy, I think, right now. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I agree. We, I think um, that part wasn't well thought out, especially some cases are treated with external beam at one location and referred elsewhere for brachy. Yeah, and, and that's for GYN especially, that's a major concern. And what do you do with those? Um, you're going to totally discourage that sort of thing. And yeah. So that needs to be rethought. That's a great point, yeah. This is from your friend Ashish Patel. Have you seen any volume deformation issues with pre-procedure contouring with cervix brachy? Uh, yes, a ton. So <laughs> I'll tell you is that uh, there is great uncertainty in the registration and practically speaking, it requires a lot of toggling back and forth between the CT and MRI. Um, I've kind of morphed in our vantage point to not trusting our GTV uh, brachytherapy um, that uh, much. I think it's really useful even in the way we use it for contouring a high-risk CTV. Um, but the tissue deformation is particularly problematic around, for example, like a low uh, exophytic uh, cervical cancer uh, because you, you're putting cranial pressure when you put the, um, the applicator in into the Smith sleeve. Uh, has lots of issues. So we're really careful about that. You certainly cannot, um, as you see for the GEC estro images, like just directly take a solid um, fusion. So. I have a question for one of our residents who you'll get to visit with later. Vishal um, is asking, what are your thoughts about ultrasound-based prostate HDR planning and treatment delivery in terms of workflow and facility resources? I love it. I mean, that's what the full disclosure, that's exactly what we use. Uh, so I, I personally um, don't see a ton of added value for MR over ultrasound. You know, the, the volume estimates are pretty similar. Um, the ultrasound probes are fantastic these days. You know, really all, I don't have like a particular one that we think is great, but they're all uh, really good. Um, we implemented uh, HDR breaking therapy after there was already uh, solid evidence to support single fraction HDR boost uh, and two fraction uh, HDR monotherapy. So those are the approaches we use at UVA. Uh, the software that we use, and I, I just don't have experience with the competing software, um, does allow for MR registration with the ultrasound. And we've been exploring that in the uh, salvage setting and for dose differentiated uh, for HDR boost. I have a couple more questions. Uh, another one from Tony Ng. What brachytherapy techniques do you use for non-operable endometrial cancer at UVA? Um, that I feel is the most challenging um, set of procedures for in the GYN brachytherapy space, in my opinion. Um, we only have a, um, a CT compatible Y applicator setting, so we don't use um, alternative approaches. I do feel very strongly that uh, moving beyond a single tandem approach and, and using a at least two tandems is important. I've not had great success with the third uh, straight tandem that's available with that kit. Um, I really struggle with these. If if you want to see me sweat and maybe um, perforate a case, uh, perforate a uterus at the end of a case, it's these. Um, it's really challenging uh, patients. 
Uh, but that that's all we use. I don't. I, I think there. You know, there's plenty of other alternative approaches that are great. We just that's all we have experience with. This is why I wish we weren't virtual because I'd love to ask Tony Ng that same question. You know. Yeah, me too. Yeah. The experience, and he's asking a question, but I, I'd love to read a response. So Tony, if you're if you type fast enough. Yeah. If you've got tips, let me know, man. <laughs> it's a really challenging situation. One more question here. David Lawson is asking, is there a role for brachytherapy in spine tumors, including metastasis? That's a tough one too. I, maybe. I, I don't know. I will tell you um, when things get really challenging like this and when there's, there are very good external beam alternatives, um, my enthusiasm wanes. I think certainly if somebody, um, uh, you know, has experience in that and has the right setup for it, perhaps because certainly in a re irradiation setting, you're going to get less dose to the to the spinal cord. Uh, for example, uh, I just don't know, um, but it's certainly an area to explore. My sense is that that would be an advance that would be uh, niched to uh, spine centers of excellence. Um, but I would encourage people to explore that area. I think it's it's quite interesting. Yeah. Tony did, uh, Tony did enter a response. He says, I found that lo for large uteri, a third tandem is very helpful. Yes. Yeah, and, and that in a lot of times, the frustration and the, and the um, Tim sweating like over, over like down through his, uh, his cap is, is um, with the small uteri in like very elderly like, and obese patients that are like very thin walled. That's where I just get the two in and stop. But you're absolutely right. A very large uterus, um, third tandem is very helpful. I've also found that um, leading in with external beam radiation, which is people often talk about worrying about transmural extension or lymph node involvement being the indication, I've often found that going ahead and committing to a course of external beam radiation helps uh, shrink and ob potentially obstructive tumor in a large uterus uh, and um, stop bleeding, which can help with the procedure. Yeah. Okay, Tim. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and uh, we really appreciate it. We've learned a lot. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Have a good day.